Hello there, welcome back to the channel and continuing my exploration of the differing fleets, the rivaling fleets and forces of the Klingons and the Romulans from Star Trek. What makes them so similar and so different? And this episode is really going to explore that concept, at least from a certain point of view. Hmm, wrong franchise. Anyway, we're looking at the Klingon D7 class battlecruiser the most feared symbol of the Klingon Empire in the late 23rd century. Before we get started, please like, share, subscribe and comment down below on your thoughts on this vessel and its earlier appearances of sorts. This class of vessel was descended from precursor designs such as the D5 class cruiser that existed in the mid 22nd century, sharing very similar hull geometry, although they were of a bit of a different size. The D7 class came into being formally in 2257 under the orders of Chancellor Lorel, the first new Chancellor of the Klingon Empire after the Federation Klingon War. This was a way of unifying the different Klingon houses who had quite differing approaches to fleet design. The Klingon Empire in the last few centuries had become very sectarian with the different houses of the what would make up the High Council having their own sort of mini empires and fleets and armies at their own disposal. And although this wouldn't effectively change that much as this was sort of still the structure of the Klingon Empire by the 24th century, the D7 was meant to unify and streamline the fleets. It would both be a symbol of the Klingon Empire and of their unity and of a sort of more, co more coherent and cohesive fleet aesthetic. The vessel itself was quite a departure from the classifications of ships the Klingons were using up to this point, which were quite different. The Bird of Prey being a very striking difference in design. The ship was 228 meters in length. It was armed with variable weapons, but as standard, it carried a forward photon torpedo launcher and two main disruptor cannons, as well as auxiliary pulse plasma weapons, as well as sometimes additional disruptor arrays, aft torpedo launcher, and occasionally even phasers. This speaks probably to the fact that different houses were building the ship and although they use the same basic design they are probably often customized it as would a ship's captain. Klingon captains were noted for often modifying and customizing their ships to their own needs over time so the longer the ship was in service the more of a departure it might have taken from its original stock form but there we have it. The vessel will be crewed with over 400 Klingon officers and soldiers and had a lot of similar technologies to its Federation counterparts such as transporters and of course warp drive shields which were roughly comparable in many ways. The D7 was not a straight match for the formidable Constitution class cruiser of Starfleet but in numbers was more deadly because the Klingons simply built more of these ships and often concentrated their forces as Klingons liked to fight in groups. In addition to this, the vessel could rival a Constitution class for speed at both sublight and warp capability, and was simply no joke of a vessel. The Klingon D7 was a powerful ship and with the mainstay of the Klingon Navy for the next 20 odd years, until approximately 2270, when the vessel will begin to be phased out for a new variant known as the Katinga class, which will get its own dedicated video rather than just merge them into this one. The sticking with the D7, this ship would most famously be shared during a brief alliance between the Klingon Empire and the Romulan Star Empire, with the Romulans sharing the design for a time and building their own version of it. The Romulan version was superficially the same as the Klingon, with similar weaponry. Torp photon torpedoes, disruptor array shields. This was done because the Romulans lacked a really good heavy battlecruiser design. Also, as I mentioned in previous videos, the Romulans had issues with power generation. Basically, the Klingons fixed a lot of these issues for the Romulans at the time by providing the ship. Interior was similar, but the again, the color palette of, an in, of the interior of a Romulan ship was, again, much more oppressive and full of reds and browns and mauve and things like that, basically more oppressive colours. As I've said to a human, they would make the rooms feel small and claustrophobic, but to a Romulan apparently they're fine. Klingons would likely find it very garish and opulent, whereas they preferred a more Spartan style interior to their ships, more utilitarian, brutalistic. Although we never got a good look at the inside of a Klingon D7, uh, in the 23rd century anyway, 
we did get looks at the interior of the Romulans. One of the other technical exchanges between these two powers that took place was the Romulans sharing their cloaking capabilities with the Klingons. This also saw a leap forward in the technology with the vessels now able to utilize sensors and other subsystems while cloaked, even able to utilize higher propulsion systems, at least impulse anyway, while cloaked properly rather than having to move along at a snail's pace like the Romulan Bird of Prey had to do before that. This was likely, again, uh, a result of the Klingons sharing their power generation technology with the inferior Romulan power systems used at the time. There was one of these vessels which would have a, a very long lifespan. It will be converted into something of a generational vessel. It will be encountered again in the late 24th century in the 2370s by the USS Voyager deep in the Delta Quadrant, having travelled for decades on a holy quest by its crew, looking basically for the Klingon Messiah, who they decided was Belon Notorious' unborn child. Basically, Klingon Jesus. This vessel was not any more advanced than the vessels that have come before it. It's reasonable to assume, again, they'd made upgrades just like Voyager did along the way, but Voyager was able to exploit weaknesses that were known to the classification of ship, which dated back all the way to the 23rd century, exploit but notably weaknesses in the vessel's cloaking device. The ship was aesthetically a little bit more like the Katinga class, so to me it may have actually undergone some kind of refits before it decided to go AWOL from the Klingon Empire and go off on its deep space religious mission. This was the last known D7 battlecruiser in service, although others did pop up. One of them, for example, which was also a ship filled with sleeping Klingons, woke up in the 2360s again and was... it had to be hunted down because the Klingons thought that they were still at war with the Federation, or at the very least the Federation was still their enemy, and there were multiple Un or light lightly defended or undefended colonies and outposts in the area of where the ship was and they had to intercept the vessel and convince the crew that the Federation and the Klingons are now allies. This was done by Worf and his Parmakai at the time by pretending to be the commanding officers of the USS Enterprise D and telling the Klingons, stand down, you're basically betraying the Klingon Empire right now, and it worked. There was nothing known to be anything more remarkable about this particular vessel, but this was a ship that again had stood the test of time, surviving decades out in deep space, saying something, again, for Klingon power generation technology, or at least power conservation, that their ships are still functional after so long. These vessels were most noted for their various engagements with the, with the famed Federation captain, Captain James Tiberius. Kirk, commander of the Enterprise, often going into battle with these ships on behalf of the Federation in various border wars. These vessels would maintain a significant threat to the Federation for a considerable length of time throughout the late 23rd century. Although it's never been categorically confirmed, the vessel will have seen service for many years after this time period. Even though new variants like the Katinga class came out to replace it, it is conceivable that many D7s were modernized into the Katinga class with all of its um, aztec on the hull and other modifications, including strength, strengthening of the hull, strengthening of the shields and the weapons, which notably the shields of the ship were inferior to those used by the Federation, although weapons were easily comparable, if not more powerful. And the Klingon sent to not throw things away, so I can easily see these ships being used for many years. They were definitely still in use by the 2280s, but may have been phased out from frontline use by this point and after that may have become either training vessels or some kind of fleet, Klingon equivalent of fleet auxiliary. As there's nothing hard on that, it's more of an assertion than fact. These vessels would also be the main ships that the Klingons would use in their various antagonistic border conflicts with the Romulans throughout that time period, as well as all of their other enemies, notably the Breen, who the Klingons attempted to invade around this time period with a fleet of D7 battlecruisers which was an unmitigated disaster, with the Breen able to destroy the entire fleet. Although it's reasonable, again, to assume much of that fleet was probably made of transports and birds of prey as well, the D7 was the most powerful ship the Klingons had, and as far as we can tell, the Breen absolutely wiped the floor with it. I just want to take this moment to thank you for watching that video. If you liked what you saw, 
please check out my social links in the description box below to Instagram and Twitter and others. And there also is down there a link to my Patreon page where you can support this channel and the others as I try to grow this franchise and do this more regularly. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you for watching and bye bye.